probability. And again, we are gratified to see that this data could also be modeled by a simple Raleigh closed system evolution. The main difference here is that the data fall along a curve defined by a much different or a much higher fractionation or enrichment factor compared to any of the earlier experiments I've shown you. So indeed, we do see a significant difference in the isotopic fractionation patterns that we see for electrolytic iron versus the commercial grades of iron. Now, what is it that could be controlling this? As I mentioned in the, in the introduction, one of the factors that may result in a different fractionation pattern may be different reaction mechanisms or different pathways. And in fact, one of the reasons we chose to look at electrolytic iron is it had been speculated that abiotic dechlorination might take place on electrolytic iron via a different distribution of pathways than it does in commercial grades of iron. Specifically, abiotic dechlorination has traditionally been thought to take place via a process known as hydrogenolysis, which involves replacement of a single chlorine by a hydrogen in a stepwise degradation process, where, for instance, PCE would lose a single chlorine and gain a hydrogen to form TCE. Subsequently, we'd lose one more chlorine and gain a hydrogen to form DCE, etc. More recently, however, Roberts et al. proposed that there may, in fact, be a second parallel pathway of abiotic dechlorination taking place at the same time as hydrogenolysis. And that suggestion was the pathway of beta elimination, which involves reduction elimination of two chlorine ions in a single step. Under this type of scenario, then, PCE would lose two chlorines in a single step to form dichloroacetylene as a transitory intermediate, and there on down the rest of the degradation pathway. Similarly, TCE would lose two chlorines and immediately form chloroacetylene. Now, I would like to be careful here. We're not saying at the moment that the isotopic differences that we see in commercial grades of iron versus electrolytic iron confirm that there are different pathways. That is simply one potential hypothesis. I mentioned that there are a number of different properties between electrolytic iron and commercial grades of iron, and any of these differences in properties could be what's resulting in the difference in fractionation that we see. For example, they have very different surface properties. Electrolytic iron is a fine powder, whereas the uh, commercial grades of iron are granular iron filings. With very different surface properties, it could be this that's controlling the difference in fractionation. And in fact, confirming which of these two hypotheses is actually controlling the difference in isotopic fractionation that we see is the subject of ongoing research. To briefly conclude where we are with respect to this research at the moment, though, the most important finding is that abiotic dechlorination is indeed non-conservative. We see very large fractionation signals, signals that can then be used to tell us something about the way in which abiotic dechlorination is taking place. Those patterns are highly reproducible and therefore lend themselves well to the development of predictive models. And finally, we are seeing important differences in patterns of fractionation. For instance, highly reproducible differences in the patterns and extent of fractionation on commercial grades of iron versus electrolytic iron. These differences are no doubt providing us with keys to information about the ways in which dechlorination takes place differently on these two different types of irons. And future research hopefully will allow us to shed some more light on that uh, specific topic. In the more short term, however, I hope that you'll be able to see that the research that we've shown you already has some important potential applications. In this hypothetical scenario, if you've got an iron wall in place at a particular site in order to remediate a chlorinated hydrocarbon plume, and you find yourself in the unfortunate situation of having higher than anticipated or higher than calculated concentrations of TCE, for instance, down gradient of that, of that iron wall, you may be looking at one of two potential scenarios. You may have a situation where the hydraulic gradients have changed or have been miscalculated, and in fact, your dissolved plume is bypassing the wall and not undergoing degradation. Alternatively, you may have a situation where the plume passes nicely through the wall, but because of some sort of installation problem, is undergoing incomplete or less than anticipated degradation. As I've said, I hope you can see that the results that we've shown you so far may allow you to distinguish between these two scenarios. In this particular case, the delta C13 signature of that TCE is already is I'm sorry is likely to still be very similar to the delta C13 signature of the source, since it will not have undergone abiotic dechlorination. In contrast, in this case, the delta C13 signature of the TCE is already likely to be significantly different than the source, because with that type of very large 
40 per mil fractionation signal, even a small amount of difference in the extent of degradation can already add up to a very large difference in the isotopic signature. We'll now be changing gears and taking a look at this issue of biodegradation, starting with biodegradation of the chlorinated hydrocarbons. Again, I'll show you first the results from the laboratory phase of the experiments, which were a series of batch bile experiments looking at anaerobic biodegradation of TCE by a mixed consortia cultured from contaminated soil. Again, what we're looking at on the y-axis is the delta C13 signature of the residual TCE, and on the x-axis, um, we're looking at 100% TCE before degradation and then moving this way down the axis as biodegradation increases. The delta C13 signature of TCE under the course of biodegradation is non-conservative and that's perhaps one of the most fundamental conclusions of this data. The second important point is the types of fractionations that we see for chlorinated hydrocarbons are very large. In this particular example they're on the order of 15 per mil. The delta C13 signature of the TCE starts out at about minus 30 per mil before degradation, and as degradation proceeds, we see that at the end we have a classic isotopic enrichment trend with the delta C13 signature of the residual TCE at more than minus 15 per mil. Once again, we see highly reproducible results with duplicate sets of experiments, nonetheless all following on a classic closed system Raleigh evolution curve. Once again, this type of highly reproducible behavior is very important as we start to try and model these systems. The significance of these results is that with large non-conservative behavior and large fractionation factors, indeed the potential will be there to use these types of fractionations in order to tell us something about intrinsic bioremediation. In essence, the large fractionations associated with biodegradation mean that the potential is there to use them to identify or distinguish between the effects of biodegradation and the effects of non-fractionating processes of mass loss, such as dissolution, volatilization, etc. We've carried out these experiments looking at a number of different compounds using a variety of different microbial consortia. Just to round this out, I'm going to show you the results for one set of experiments looking at anaerobic biodegradation of PCE in this case. Once again, we see a large fractionation over the course of the um, experiment. Once again, we see highly reproducible behavior, although obviously a little bit less so at this end of the experiment. Nonetheless, most of this data can be nicely fitted again by a single closed system Raleigh evolution curve, which in, with in this case a fractionation factor of about 7 per mil. In a series of ongoing experiments, we're continuing to take a look at different groups of primary contaminants. We're starting as well to compile information about the isotopic behavior of the breakdown products in order to try and build them into more sophisticated models. We're looking at different microbial consortia and of course under different environmental conditions, both aerobic and anaerobic, with the ultimate goal of this phase of the laboratory experimentation being to try and develop quantitative data about the relationship of fractionation patterns to the nature and extent of biodegradation with the ultimate goal being developing predictive models that can then be used to try and explain field results. In fact, I did not want to leave you today without giving you some flavor of where the field component of this research is going. So in fact, the site that made the most sense, or the field study that made the most sense to highlight then, would be a site where it is believed that anaerobic biodegradation of a TCE plume is undergoing by intrinsic bioremediation. Essentially, we selected a very well-studied site where all of the other parameters that had been measured there led them to believe that intrinsic bioremediation of a TCE plume is occurring. What we wanted to do then is go in with our isotopic approach and see whether it could confirm or deny that interpretation of the site and give us a good comparison to the laboratory results. What we did then is selected a site that has a well-constrained TCE plume. Concentrations of TCE are shown in PPB and we're going from wells that have concentrations greater than hundreds of thousands of PPB in wells close to where free product has been found in the past. And then as we move down the plume in two transects, transect one and transect two, we're decreasing to thousands of PPB, hundreds of PPB, and less than 50 PPB at the plume periphery. Given that their understanding at this site is that these concentration gradients are driven not just by groundwater transport, but by intrinsic 
biodegradation. What we wanted to do is to measure the delta C13 signatures of these wells as we move down those concentration or biodegradation gradients. In other words, we wanted to take a look at the delta C13 signature of the TCE as we went from the core of the plume, which is presumably the least biodegraded, to the plume periphery, which is the most biodegraded. What we found then for transic 1 and 2 are essentially identical trends. The delta C13 signature of the residual TCE is shown on the y-axis, and the concentration gradient is shown on the x-axis. For transic 1, then, we're going from the core of the plume, where we have the highest TCE concentrations, presumably the least biodegraded, and moving down the concentration gradient. And what we indeed see is a trend of increasing C13 enrichment in the TCE with increasing biodegradation. Exactly the same thing for transic 2, increasing C13 enrichment with increasing extent of biodegradation. To summarize then, at the field site, as we saw in the laboratory experiments, we see a classic delta C13 enrichment trend that seems to reflect this preferential degradation of carbon-12 bearing TCE. So this field site has provided us with excellent confirmation of the laboratory results, and once again, said to us that stable carbon isotopes will indeed be an important tool for looking at intrinsic bioremediation. In particular, stable isotope fractionation signals may provide us with an important means of establishing that mass loss is due to a strongly fractionating process, such as biodegradation, versus a non-fractionating process of mass loss, such as dissolution, volatilization, or adsorption. In most of today's talk, I focused on the work that's being done looking at chlorinated hydrocarbons. But I didn't want to leave you today without providing you at least with a small overview of where the parallel lines of research that we're conducting on the BTEX group of compounds are leading us. Again, I wanted to highlight a field study, and it seemed that the most important one to highlight would be one where the strategy was very similar to that that you just saw at the TCE site. In other words, we picked a site where there is a well-constrained toluene plume in this case, this plume is undergoing biodegradation, but it is an actually an enhanced aerobic biodegradation scheme. Our strategy then was the same, to take a look at isotopic variation as we move down the concentration gradient, given that the concentration gradients at this site are once again believed to be, um, in a large measure, controlled by biodegradation as well as groundwater transport. Once again, this site consists of a concentrated toluene plume with 100 ppm levels at the core of the plume, and we moved out from that core in a series of transects to look at the variation in delta C13 signature of that toluene as we move from the core of the plume, which is least biodegraded, to the plume periphery, which is most biodegraded. As you can see from this slide, the results here look very different from anything else that I've shown you today. Delta C13 signature of the toluene is shown on the y-axis. On the x-axis, we have concentration. So again, we are moving from the most concentrated or least degraded core of the plume out to the plume periphery, which should be the most biodegraded. Unlike anything that you saw for the chlorinated hydrocarbons, what we see here is for all 12 wells measured at the site, the delta C13 signature of the toluene is isotopically identical within 0.5 per mil, which again is the accuracy and reproducibility for GCC IRMS. We actually returned to this site three months later in order to confirm these results and again found the same thing. For all 12 wells studied at the site, we see absolutely no change in the isotopic signature of the toluene. In other words, for toluene, it looks like biodegradation is a much more conservative process. We have also confirmed these results doing a series of laboratory experiments in those experiments, which have been repeated a number of times with a number of different microbial consortia, we see exactly the same thing. Even with very extensive amounts of biodegradation, as you're moving down this way down the x-axis, we see no change in the delta C13 signature of the residual toluene. Biodegradation for toluene, therefore, appears to be much more conservative. This is a lot of information to throw at you today particularly in a field where so much of the research that's taking place is still taking place at a very fundamental level, trying to determine exactly what the nature and extent of fractionation is for different key compounds under different processes in the subsurface. 
But what I hope I've been able to convince you of is that stable carbon isotopes can provide us with important information about both the source of the contaminants and about processes controlling their transport and attenuation. What type of information we obtain is going to be a function of the specific compound that we're looking at. As we've seen, toluene and the BTEX group of compounds appear to behave much more isotopically conservatively and therefore to have more potential as source differentiators. In contrast, we've seen that chlorinated hydrocarbons undergo very significant fractionation under the action of subsurface processes such as biodegradation. Therefore, stable carbon isotopes provide us with more opportunity to obtain information about those processes. In the course of our future research, we're continuing to take a look at characterizing controls on conservative versus non-conservative isotopic behavior, and in particular to examine what appears to be this very compound-specific nature of isotopic behavior. Depending on their physical structure, different compounds will have different isotopic behaviors. The ultimate goal is to develop a quantitative database describing the reproducibility of fractionations under different conditions information that can then be used to build models that will help us with interpretation of more complex field sites. As I mentioned, a talk of this nature has obviously benefited from discussions and experimental help from a wide variety of different participants, and I'd like to thank a large number of these people here today. And in particular, we'd like to mention and thank the various funding groups that have contributed to supporting different aspects of this research. Thank you very much for your attention.